So Florian, thank you very much. Uh, hello everyone. Just a first question from my side. So who has an SAP system in their company running? So that looks good. Who has a penetration tester? Okay, thanks a lot. So my name is Frederik Weidemann. I'm the head of consulting at uh, Virtual Forge. Uh, I'm an active security researcher in the SAP area since 2006. I'm co-author of the book Secure ABBA Programming. I'm also a trainer for Secure ABBA Programming. Um, you can book the trainings uh, in Waldorf University as an example. I have done frequent publications. I had also played in the past lots of uh, Capture the Flag contests, uh, academic uh, Capture the Flag contests with uh, several top three places. And I'm a speaker at various conferences. Hans Christian. Yeah, hi everyone. I also work for Virtual Forge. Uh, I'm primarily a developer there. I also do security research. And in the past I have done, uh, I played capture the flag contests like Fred. Uh, I've also organized some capture the flag contests and my uh, research interests uh, other than that are uh, programming languages and virtual machines. Yeah, I also uh, spoke at various conferences. So what's the agenda for today? Um, I want to go back and elaborate a little bit on what Mariano presented in 2007 because some things changed in November last year. Um, so I, I want to talk again on those called back attacks, um, which you may know, and I want to elaborate on that, how you can really exploit with them and how you can really play around. Um, so the idea is to present you how it basically works, just a short introduction into that, because I see that most of the people are already the, within the SAP area. Uh, then I will show uh, how we can actually do the exploitation, what's the vulnerability within the callback mechanism. I want you to understand the risks. Uh, okay, that's your. And then I want to talk about exploitation techniques so that the people get an understanding that this is not something theoretic. And then, of course, uh, how you can actually mitigate it. Okay, so what is uh, SAP RFC? Uh, RFC stands for Remote Function Call. It's basically the RPC equivalent uh, within the SAP landscape. It's a proprietary communication protocol. Uh, it's used for the communication between the SAP systems. So you can connect uh, a J2E engine, for example, with an ABAP system and vice versa. Um, if you do a double stack installation, there's also some sort of uh, RSC communication in between. There are some external servers we have seen in, no, he is not here anymore, but we have seen in the previous talk um, registering servers. We have also seen that with the T-Rex installation uh, of JP. Uh, you can also hook on, let's say, external servers to the systems. Those, th this protocol is basically used to, uh, let's say, perform business critical communication, okay? Uh, considering the attack surface with the RFC protocol, it is in the way that within EHP 6 and ECC 6, we have around 35,000 remote enabled function modules. Within the solution manager, we have 27,500 modules. So that's quite a large attack surface and that doesn't include, let's say, anything someone else puts on top with custom code installations, their own coding and such stuff third-party add-ons, and so on. Um, thinking about a typical large enterprise SAP landscape, then we have literally thousands of RFC destinations. Um, those destinations, or these, uh, there are basically three different uh, connection types. There's the standard RFC client, uh, which I recently learned has the official name of SAP NetWeaver Application Server for ABAP RFC client. And then there's the possibility of the registered external server and you can also have an external RFC client. And all of these are used to communicate with the RFC server, in short. So how does it look like uh, from a technical point of view? So basically I can connect two systems here. I have an example solution manager CSM and I have an example ECC6 ECC6 
BHP6, uh, which is uh, configured as the SID C66. You can also run that via HTTP, but we will focus now on the RFC protocol itself. So how does it work within the ABAP stack? So let's think about the connection from CSM to C66. Within ABAP, it would look like this. So you have call function, then you have your function name, and then you specify a destination, and that destination needs to be configured within the uh, transaction SM59. So there you can connect uh, yeah, there you can connect, uh, configure ABAP connections. Uh, for those connections, there are different possibilities how to do authentication. I don't want to go into the details there. Uh, if you look at large, let's say, scenarios, you very often end up with some technical usernames or alternatively with trusted connections. So uh, if you can connect to one system, you may also connect to another system. But that's not the strong focus here, right? So we have heard earlier in all those talks that there are literally many possibilities if you compromise one system and you have users in other systems, uh, yeah, then you can compromise the second system. So if I can compromise CSM, most likely I can also compromise C66. Okay, but what would happen if that connection is not working like a diode? Right, so it's not one way. I can also do a connection back, right? So that would change the things a little bit. So let's go into uh, the details of that. Um, the difference here is if I'm within C66, then I use the destination back. So if CSM now calls system or the destination C66 and the function Z business partner, then actually that function would be run. And this function basically makes a call back to the caller, so the, to the system CSM. So that's the callback attack uh, Mariano reused in all those men in the middle attacks and somehow. But well, after that presentation, nothing really happen. So let's let's dig into the details. So if we have the same situation. The only difference here is maybe that within CSM, if we do that back connection, then we have a check against SRFC, which is basically similar to the ST code check if you start a transaction. It's it's just a, an initial startup check. Which is quite fun. So I have the possibility if I'm System one, I connect to system two, and system two actually can also use functionality of my system. Which looks like this. Okay, so now thinking about how to exploit this, right? So what can I do about it? So the idea would be to find interesting function modules that most likely a high privileged user is using. So think about function modules. Some would, would call from system one with a high privilege because we somehow need to circumvent that SRFC authorization check at least. And when we think about that, um, one of the examples would be so we can do connection tests for RFC connections. So that's a plain example, which we will just show now in a demo how we can exploit that. So let's go for the real life example. Okay, so um, as Fred has explained, the idea is to find a RFC enabled function uh, that you can count on that it's going to be called sooner or later. So um, the idea was to use a function that's defined in the SAP standard. And uh, so, one of those functions that gets called often is ping. Um, so, for this demo, I will log into a system called C66. Now, this system is um, 
allowing a connection from the system called CSM. I want to get a user on the system CSM. So I have SAP all permissions on C66. Now let's try what I can, let's see what I can achieve. Okay. Okay, pass the challenge to log on. You locked me off. Sorry? You locked me off. It's okay. Oh, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so I've uh, already prepared some code. Um, do you, now, Fred showed the uh, solution manager configuration interface. The idea is if the administrator clicks on the test connection button, um, what this does is it issues a ping. Unfortunately, the way the ping is called um, prevents me from calling something back. So I had to look for another function, and another function that is called by the solution manager is called function exists. This is also defined in the SAP standard. So let's try to edit that function. Sorry. Here we are. Okay, um, basically I'm enabling this code. And as you can see, the first check I do, I, I check whether this is called from a user called SMCSM. This is a service user used by the solution manager. And what I do here is uh, I call another standard function called BAP user create destination back and I create some new user. And after that I assign to that user uh, the privilege SAP all. And I log it into a table so I see that it was successful. Uh, I think Fred will talk a little about how to act, edit code in the SAP namespace if you don't have a development key for that but I do so I can just use the standard editor and activate the code. And so let's tr see if I can already log into CSM. Oh, I guess. <laughs> so maybe you should kill the user. Either, either um, it just pinged it by, by a cron job or something, or I forgot to delete the user from the previous demo. So maybe... Um, this is why we do live demos, to yeah. have some fun. Are uh, you going to delete it? Or? Yeah. Thanks. So Good. it should be gone. So let's try again. Hopefully I'm unsuccessful this time. Yeah, doesn't work. So now I wait for the CSM admin to try to look if my system is still reachable. So that would be one way how I could execute that functionality, uh, let's say, uh, within the technical landscape overview. Um, so I can do here technical checks and I can also check for the RFC status, as you can see. Uh, HC last called this uh, function and what I'm going to do is I'm just executing it. Okay, now if I'm lucky I should be able to log back in. Yeah, works again. Okay, here I am and I can I can look up my user and Sub all, so I can basically do whatever I want. Okay. So if maybe just uh, another comment, if I don't want to wait for some admin to ping my system, I could try to find another function that I hook into. Um, one of the of the conditions that has to be met in order for this to work is the administrator that pings me does need the permission to create new users. So 
Okay. Let's have a discussion on that. So right. what would be a meaningful function module that you would like to exploit in order to ensure that most likely the caller who is accessing you has high privileges? Well, as an example, or I could think about function modules that are used, which we actually used within the exploit, so that are related to central user management, as an example, or to create a user. So when someone calls that function, it is very likely that this user also will have the possibility to create users in the local system, most likely. Okay. Um, so the idea is basically here to get an understanding what kind of meaningful function I would like to find and how I can really exploit this. Of course, if I go for SAP all, that's one of the examples. But thinking about 35,000 modules that are remotely enabled and not all of them contain authorization checks, um, some of them in the past had also, let's say, uh, zero days uh, with missing auth authorization checks and were nowadays patched. Um, some are also patched with the uh, switchable uh, authorization framework. So it's kind of very likely that you will find some function that you can really abuse in order to do something nasty. And we were already seeing in the previous talks vendors logistics, HR. So the ideas are, are yeah, you get the imagine. I, I have also seen some, some systems where SAP itself says it, it's mandatory to have RFC connections configured with SAP all, otherwise the modules are not running properly with each other. So in that case, um, yeah, well, then obviously it's a no-brainer. So you need somehow to understand what you can do. Okay, so let's, let's talk about a little bit more what is the requirement for the attacker. So HC just modified the SAP standard, right? So that's unlikely to happen in production, except for the cases that we find one of those many vulnerabilities that are out there. But what every customer most likely also has is a developing system. Right, and within that developing system, most likely you will have some developers. So, and by definition, those developers possess the necessary rights to develop code. Or, what we have also seen in the talk of Andreas is if you have some sort of operating system command injection, or if you have the possibility to be a, a basis guide, then you can go on the um, command line and from there you can install transports. If you can install transports, you could use the XPRI as an example to execute your own code while importing the transport. Okay, so as a result, if that prerequisite is given and the attacker is malicious, he can basically call any remote enabled function module in the calling system, so CSM. Of course, SRFC is performed as an authorization check, and we need to somehow grab a user uh, so that we can, yeah, work with the escalator privileges. So thinking about SRFC star, what's the standard situation with that authorization object at customers? So how many people have that authorization object assigned? Well, not at every customer, every user. I have seen that sometimes, but what I see in average Let's say if you get to a customer for the first time as an assessment, um, then you will have the situation that at least the key users will have SRFC star. So at least those people who already have many authorizations, they will have that 
necessary authorization to basically call any RSC enabled function. So that I can abuse that attack. Of course, we will also have many developers within our systems. Some maybe from nearshore, maybe some from offshore, maybe some externals, maybe some internals. So it's kind of difficult to, to really control them. And in case what I sh just showed here, most likely a customer will also have a solution manager. And if I have a solution manager, most likely systems will be connected to the solution manager. And also that development system will be most likely connected to the solution manager. Because somehow you want to do system recommendations. So you will want to get an understanding what security patches you want to install within your system. So in order to do that, you need to configure a connection. Well, then, of course, like, like we said earlier, if we modify something within the user management, then this is the most likely way how you can really exploit it. Um, to be honest with you, it really depends on the target customer. Yes, that attack has to be crafted, so you need some sort of expert level um, or some sort of internal know-how, how the landscape looks like. Thinking about a developer, that developer by definition has the possibility to write his own ABAP code and by using or by writing his own ABAP code, he can basically access every information within the system or he could even assign himself SAP all. So he has all the information. But okay. I think it's important to point out that while usually uh, you can review the developer's code before you move it onto a production system. In this case, you usually don't because the system is already connected to the central management system. Yeah. So the developer can run code that doesn't get checked by anyone. Yeah. So a security check, for example, between development and QA would not help in that situation. Which would end up another time in the full system compromise. So how to build the exploit? Uh, we somehow need to modify and enhance the standard. Of course, that's, that may be depending on some development keys and that may be also dependent on some modification keys and such stuff. Uh, in the end, we have seen uh, earlier the report RS underscore repair underscore source. That's quite similar to a custom code uh, I'm just presenting which basically allows you with those six lines to modify any ABAP coding within the systems with the very few exceptions where you have, let's say there are three programs you cannot modify that way where you have to use different techniques. But for the function modules, yes, that works. Um, if you want to play around with the function modules, uh, you can also use uh, those functions with, uh, within the SAP standard. So that basically allow you to read an arbitrary function module and also to insert stuff. In the past, there had also been a, a zero day vulnerability within the insert function module, which has already been patched. Uh, and yes, those are of course also remote enabled. So. Uh, if you have a user that has S develop with the read authorization and you have SRFC, that gives you basically the information so that you can check for vulnerable ABAP function modules within the target system, right? Okay, so what can you do about it? Well, uh, there's an SAP node uh, you can install. Um, if you apply the fix, you're not yet done. So it's kind of similar with the gateway. So you need some extra effort in order to, to deal with it. Um, if you install the, the node itself, then you will notice that in SM59 there's a slight change and you get that red button and you want to get rid of that red button, but you don't only want to change it to green, but you also want to configure the system securely. So let's make the world a safer place. How can you do that? Um, well, you have to patch your system. 
And that note was released in November 2014. Um, you should also enable the security audit log because there are some kind of events that you do want to track. Uh, you should create so-called callback whitelists, which I will just show uh, on the next slide how to do that. There's also the possibility when you do custom coding to actually protect yourself with custom coding. If you make a call to that function module before you call the remote function module. Um, you should make sure that within your policy, uh, the new introduced profile parameter callback security method does not equal to zero. So that must be forbidden. And then there's a great white paper that basically describes everything you need to do that was also released, uh, which is also mentioned in the, um, in the spotlight news still in the service marketplace. So if you go for servicesap.com slash security and you look at the spotlight still today and within the second, uh, I think it's the second entry, uh, you will get the direct link to that paper. Please make sure that you do read that paper completely because it does not only cover that vulnerability but also how to deal with SRFC star and such stuff. So that's really a great paper I can really, really recommend. So there's the link uh, you will get later on the slides uh, so that you can um, dig into that paper. So how you deal with those callback whitelists, like I said, it's similar to the gateway vulnerability. There's a logging phase, there's a simulation phase, and then there's a go live phase. Well, basically, initially you say, okay, I want to log every event. I want to see all those callbacks that are happening. Then you maintain your first version. Then you can go into the simulation mode so that you only see the remaining backs that are, let's say, occurring. And once you see that you do have a rule set that basically matches the things you want to have, then you go for the go live, and this is controlled by a profile parameter. Um, I think the events within the security audit log are D, U, I, J, and K. So that's basically it. Here are the references, also the paper from Mariano in 2007. So, so it was really presented. It's really an old vulnerability here. But actually, we needed to re-raise it so that finally SAP fixed it. Right? But now you can secure your systems. So that's it for today. Thanks a lot. Questions? Mindset, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's similar to the vulnerability Mariano also presented uh, the gateway attack with the sec info where you can use that to exploit systems. Still, there are so many systems out there that are vulnerable to that attack. So it's not only about implementing the security patch because due to let's say the downward compatibility and SAP don't want to let's say if uh, let's say, have a disruption within the pro production. So they always give you all the tools to mitigate it, but you must switch this on like an EHP. And that's the part many people don't do. Yeah. Isn't there also another way of just using less high privileged accounts from the solution manager? Or would it then not work? Because I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> Because basically the requirement says you need SAP all for a solution. No, it's not SAP all. Think about the central user administration as an example. 
So there's one system that creates users in another system and most likely it will also be possible to create users in the local system. If you have that technique if, and if you modify that, let's say, SAP standard function that is called in that way, then you can be sure that within the central user administration system, you will have the necessary authorization rights. And they don't need to be SAP all. It's sufficient to have the possibility to create a new user. If I think about stuff that is related to making payments and such stuff, then I can narrow it down. So it's not always necessary to have SAP all. Of course, if I have a user, uh, a batch job that calls something via RFC and that batch job is running with SAP all, which is likely, right? Um, then I have all the necessary authorizations. So in reality, yes, I can exploit then technical user accounts where you would think that those are only, let's say, working within the local system. That's the idea behind it. So yes, I will find high privilege user accounts. Any more questions? If not, thank you guys.